Shortly after the success of Legendary Pictures' American reboot of Godzilla in 2014, Toho set into motion a new Japanese Godzilla that would serve as a reset of the franchise from the studio that started it all. Bringing on esteemed directors Hideki Anno and Shinji Higuchi, who had both created the seminal anime TV series Neon Genesis Evangelion, this new Godzilla would not only mark the beginning of a new era for Japan's most popular cinematic creation, but would also mark the largest Godzilla to date in Hideki Anno and Shinji Higuchi's 2016 film, Shin Godzilla. Let them fight. You're a wizard, Harry. You're gonna need a bigger boat. I'll be back. Death has come to your little town, Jew. Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to Chills and Thrills. My name is Connor Dunham and I am back again with Chris and we are doing the magnificent Shin Godzilla today. Now, uh, Chris, as I understand, you said you did see this one in theaters? I did. I was lucky enough to see it in theaters subtitled in, I believe that was October-ish of 2016. I still have the ticket in one of my lock boxes somewhere, but yeah, uh, great theater experience. I wish I could have been to that one. I did not make it, but uh, I did end up buying the Blu-ray for it. And then I did uh, also when I bought it, it came with like the digital code. So I got it on like a little streaming service digital code as well. So I, I pop this one on every now and again. This, uh, this is a fun film. I mean, it kind of goes... It's not as dark as the original or, you know, gritty, but I'd say it's a it's almost equivalent to 84 as kind of like a reboot, except I would probably say that I like this film a little more. Um, I have fun with it. It's a little slower. But once, uh, you know, the time that Godzilla is on the screen, I think it's phenomenal. And, you know, he goes through his different forms, which we'll talk about. But. The, the characters, um, I don't want to be too mean on the characters. You know, they keep the story rolling, but to me, they're, they're kind of bland. But I, I still have fun with this every time I watch it. You know, it's a little longer. It's about two hours long. But uh, how, do, how do you feel about Shin Godzilla on uh, your first watch and rewatches since? Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really high on this one. Uh, valid criticism there's not a lot of sort of inter inter character human drama going on but it it is unique in that it's very sort of politically driven and bureaucracy driven and all about the sort of the governmental functions and response to to godzilla and in the sort of it's sort of dark and gritty and very realistic in in more so than the original film in that sense which is like half the movie is they're talking about like what do our agreements allow us to do? What does what does the law say? What does the what does the the constitution say? What does it say about this? Like, you know, like it's very it's very unique in that regard where it's like it's kind of this like almost hyper realistic representation of like the red tape that would have to be cut through in order to for Japan to defend itself from a creature like Godzilla. You know, they're like, oh, we can mobilize the defense force. They're like, well, this isn't an enemy country or equivalent. This is a monster. There's no precedent for this, you know, and they want a meeting for everything and a, and they have to like get reports for everything. Like it's very, it's very engaging and interesting on that level where it's like, it's all about the red tape. It's all, it's all about political process. And, and so it's, it's interesting because they're, they're spitting out dialogue so fast and they edit these dialogue scenes and they go through the exposition so quickly and all the, the laws and the rules and the, this and the that, like, so it's like, it's not like this insanely like, action-packed movie but it's got this kind of energy to it where it all feels a little chaotic like the first 20 minutes they're dealing with godzilla's first appearance and it's like everything's quick cut there's always someone else talking they're moving to other rooms like it just feels like it's like keeps this high energy to it and so like it it, it kind of works that it's like it's this longer movie but it, it, again it kind of has this kind of tension that's always there uh, of stuff going on and 
and it has like the like the middle section of the movie is like this 20 minute long uninterrupted sequence where Godzilla comes ashore and then they you know they they use every they throw everything you know in the book at him and so I, I really I love this one I think the visual effects are great I think it's a great modern reboot of of Godzilla for Japan you know it does have those kind of G54 G84 kind of vibes where there's not a lot of fantasy super tech stuff like that going on but I I really love pretty much everything about this movie now have you have you seen you said you've seen the Japanese version and the dubbed version uh yeah in theaters it was only subtitled so in theaters you had to watch it subtitled and it was it's tough to keep up with some of the dialogue for the subtitled version because it, it goes by so fast sometimes and and there's like character titles and names and rankings being flashed on the screen and and so it's it was some dialogue flew by you when you were trying to read it and I'm a pretty fast reader and uh and the one thing I will say is that in subsequent viewings I always watch the dub because there's a couple of characters in this movie that are allegedly Americans or specifically the Kayako and Patterson character who is supposed to be an American who also speaks Japanese yet she speaks Japanese insanely fluently and when she speaks English it's like with this horrible accent and she's apparently an American born American raised American character so it's like you ca- I can't watch it subtitled and and buy that she is somehow uh, a, an actual American you know it's like at least in the dub everyone is speaking English and so it's kind of all equally in English and you can kind of just roll with it and assume that, 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 you know, like it's much more believable that she's American that way. And, uh, but yeah, so I watch it dub in all versions since I don't, I don't prefer the subtitle. I've watched the subtitle once or twice, but I, I go with the dub and it's, it's dubbed by, by Funimation slash Crunchyroll. So you hear a lot of familiar voices from a lot of like popular anime. So there's a lot of familiar voice actors in there. So I, I tend to prefer the dub for this one for sure. Okay. I have not seen the subtitled uh, Japanese version. So I will have to watch that one day because I, again, I have only seen the dub. So gotcha. I mean, it's, it's, it's not like there's a dramatic, they don't like butcher the dialogue or whatever. It's a faithful dub, but I mean, some people just kind of like the feel you get when you're getting the natural performance of the actors. But I, I tend to be more of a dub guy anyway. And for this one, especially because it's so dialogue heavy. And so there's not a lot of dramatic dialogue. A lot of it's very just sort of clinical bureaucratic kind of expositional discussing kind of dialogue so it's like well there's not really much to hate on in terms of the performances and the drama and the overacting or this or that and it's a it's a solid dub it's a really solid dub yeah this film is one of the ones that is very chaotic as you could say you know a lot of back and forth and like you said a lot of generals and presidents and people in power make having to make decisions about what they're going to do about Godzilla's appearance. Yeah, and and I hear, you know, I'm sure Japanese people appreciate it a bit more, but there's kind of like there are some of these moments that they kind of have this like black comedy kind of aspect to it where they'll, you know, they'll say one thing and then be like, "Oh, hold on, I'm getting a report. That's not true anymore," or something like that, you know, like and like like he's making the announcement that they don't expect that it that, that it won't be able to go on land, and then they immediately are like, "Hey, it's on land," you know, like like there's all kinds of like little like darkly kind of comedic and weird moments like that throughout this movie that I really appreciate. Like a lot of it's very much kind of taking the piss out of the Japanese government, and like you know, any movie that's like, "Hey, government suck balls," is always a little fun because you know because it's like it's like yeah it's like you know it it never hurts to cut cut the governments down at the knees when they're not getting the job done why not i always got a chuckle in this film out of the scene where the guy sits down he goes to have his bowl of like soup or noodles and he's like oh it's cold i knew this job wasn't gonna be it or you know it wasn't gonna be great (laughs) yeah they, they said yeah they said this job would be tough the noodles are cold yeah and it's like and it's funny because they're like it's like after all the leadership gets wiped out and they're like, nobody wants the job. So who's going to be the, the interim acting prime minister. And like, they pick like the agricultural like executive or something like that. And it's like, Oh my goodness. You know, it's like how far down the chain of the ladder did they have to go to find someone who they could like force the position onto. (laughs) 
Well, I'll tell you one thing. I wouldn't want it. I don't want any part of being in power over a country, whether it be the president of the United States or a minister yeah. or anything, because uh, yeah, I don't yeah, like being stressed yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I don't think, yeah, it's not something I'm, I'm jumping to want to do, especially in the midst of a uh, giant monster attack. No, not at all. Well, let me get into some background on the film. Shin Godzilla is a 2016 Japanese kaiju film written, directed, and co-edited by Hideki Anno and co-directed by Shinji Higuchi with visual effects by Higuchi and practical effects by Katsuro Anno. Founded by Toho and produced by Toho Pictures and Sin Bazaar, it is the 29th mainline installment in the Godzilla series and the 31st Godzilla film overall, and the first film in the franchise's Reiwa era, and the first film in Ano's Shin Anthology series. This stars Hiroki Hasegawa, Yutaka Takanuchi, Satami Ishihara, Ren Osugi, Akira Imoto, Kengo Kora, Mikako Ichikawa, John Kinemura, and Pierre Taki. And this film was released to theaters by Toho on July 29th, 2016. And as you said, Funimation gave it a limited English subtitled release in American theaters beginning on October 11th, 2016. And then this is kind of fun. I didn't know this, that a black and white version of the film titled Shin Godzilla Orthochromatic premiered at Ikabukuro Humax Cinemas in Tokyo on October 27, 2023, with screenings at select Japanese theaters following on October 28th and 29th. So that, that would have been kind of fun to see this in black and white. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i generally, because I know they did that with, uh, I think they've done that with like Mad Max Fury Road and Logan, where like they did like the Mad Max Fury Road, like, shiny and chrome or black and chrome edition and then they did like logan noir or something like that and i think they did the the justice is gray of Zack snyder's justice league i personally am not a fan of movies that are like oh here's the black and white version like i think that's great it sometimes speaks volumes to the quality of the cinematography and the contrast and whatnot if when you take all the color out of the image the composition is still strong enough to read well as a black and white image. Like I think that speaks volumes to like the talent and ability of these filmmakers, but I'm not someone who's terribly interested or compelled in watching the black and white version of a movie that was initially color. You know, I'm, I'd be much more interested in watching the colorized version of a black and white movie to tell you the truth, but that's just me. And uh, so, yeah, like that's cool that they did that, but I'm not terribly uh, like, eh, I, I don't, I'm not going to be like, when are we going to get the black and white version in America? I'm like, I'll, I'll live without it. Yeah, you know, I might I would take one watch of it just to just to see, you know, just a little something different, you know, and then you know, after that, yeah, I might not watch it again. Yeah, you don't get a ton of opportunities to see modern age CGI effects in black and white. So, I mean, it would be interesting, but, you know. Yeah, uh, just like. Uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say special shout out to the cast, uh, Satomi Ishihara. Every time me and my buddy ever bring up this movie, we always talk about how she's like one of the most beautiful Japanese ladies we've ever seen. I'm like, yeah, that's true. So just got to say like, she's gorgeous. <laughs> she absolutely is in this film. I a hundred percent agree with you. Yeah. I think my buddy, I think the first time he saw this movie, he's like, she's like the Japanese Scarlett Johansson. I'm like, all right. Yeah, cool. Sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Shin Godzilla was the first Toho produced Godzilla film after a period of 12 years and it is a complete re reboot to the franchise in which Godzilla attacks Japan for the first time in the modern day. So there's some a little bit of background on the film. And yeah, yeah. Uh, shout out to not doing another. Hey, go watch the 54 movie and then watch our movie. Kind of a routine, like finally committing to the full 100 percent reboot. That was very nice. Yeah. And I mean, a completely different look for Godzilla and different stages and you know we'll get into it but not just going with a classic look that Godzilla fans know they gave us something different that from what I've you know picked up on most fans like this redesign 
yeah, I'm a fan of it. You know, it's like, it's certainly, you know, we, we will get into it. It's like, it's certainly not like your sort of typical, like, oh, pick an iconic Godzilla look that would be like, you know, the the mascot of the franchise or the official sort of version of the character for, for marketing or merchandise or whatever. But it's like, for this film, it, it's like, it is an exceptional and perfect kind of design. And I mean, maybe some people dump on it or whatever. There's a lot of people that kind of get into the like, you know, they do a lot of comparisons with Godzilla 98 and they're like, this movie changed just as much or was just as much of a reinvention of that movie. Yeah, you guys all lap it up because Toho made it. It's like, no, it's like, I would say that this is a perfect example of how you kind of dramatically reinvent a character and modernize a character while still keeping it really true and faithful to the spirit of what the character is all about and, and what the character typically does. Like, like I think between G98 and this movie, you have two great examples of like a reinvention gone wrong and a reinvention gone right. Yeah. I, uh, th- this is a good one. I, I like this one. I like the reboot. This could have been way worse. You know, I, I clearly anyone who has been listening and Chris, you know, while joining me, I wasn't, the biggest fan of the 84 reboot, the 2014 Americanized reboot. I, I highly dug that. Um, going back to the 98 film, I, I liked it for what it was. And then you get this, that is an actual like full out reboot, not saying the 98 or the 2014 weren't, but just where you're actually digging into the government, like, 70% of this film is how the government is going to get their people to safety and handle Godzilla and stuff. And I don't know besides like the 54 version, how, if that's ever been done since then. Yeah. Yeah. 54 and 84 are kind of the only ones where they're kind of like, where like the prime minister is like a key character in the movie, you know, like I, I think most of the other Godzilla movies are at like lower levels. You know, so so it is interesting to go about it and in a way where it's like not in like a very sci fi setting, like the prime ministers, like the other countries understand why we're making a Mecha Godzilla, you know, like that sort of thing. Like, that's fun and all like I'm not I'm not hating on that, but it's like this is a very sort of real world and grounded movie. There's no super tech. There's no oxygen destroyer. There's no super X. There's no maser tanks like like there's not even any sort of special missiles or anything like that. Like this is in terms of the technology and the and the real world grounded level of the humans like this is even more this is maybe arguably the most real world and grounded of all of the films so uh, at least of all of toho's films so yeah before uh we dig into a little more get into all the good stuff of the episode we'll uh get into a trailer maybe get a uh, chris to read us off a plot synopsis and uh go from there Gotcha. When the Japan Coast Guard investigates an abandoned yacht in Tokyo Bay, its boat is destroyed and the Tokyo Bay Aqualine is flooded. After seeing a viral video of the incident, 
Deputy Chief Cabinet Secretary Rando Yaguchi believes it was caused by a living creature, which is confirmed as news reports reveal its tail emerging from the ocean. Shortly thereafter, the creature moves inland, crawling through the Kamata district of Tokyo, leaving a path of death and destruction during a disorganized and chaotic evacuation. The creature quickly evolves into a bipedal form, but overheats and returns to the sea. The government officials focus on military strategy and civilian safety. Yaguchi is put in charge of a task force researching the creature. With the high radiation readings from the creature's path, the task force realizes that it is energized by nuclear fission. The U.S. sends a special envoy, Kayoko Ann Patterson, who reveals that Goro Maki, a disgraced anti-nuclear zoology professor, studied mutations caused by radioactive contamination, predicting the appearance of the creature. Maki was disbelieved by both American and Japanese scientific circles. The U.S. then prevented him from making his conclusions public. The abandoned yacht in Tokyo Bay belonged to Maki, who left his research notes jumbled into a code on the boat before disappearing. The creature, named Godzilla, after Maki's research, reappears in its fourth form, twice its original size, making landfall near Kamakura. The Japan Self-Defense Forces mobilize but prove ineffective as Godzilla breaks through their defenses into Tokyo. The U.S. intervenes with a massively destructive airstrike plan, prompting the evacuation of civilians and government personnel. Godzilla is wounded with MOP bunker buster bombs, but responds with destructive atomic rays fired from its mouth and dorsal plates, destroying a helicopter carrying the Prime Minister, along with top government officials and incinerating large swaths of Tokyo. Depleting its energy, Godzilla enters a dormant state and becomes immobile. Yaguchi's team discovers that Godzilla's plates and blood work as a cooling system, theorizing that it could use a coagulating agent to freeze Godzilla. Analyzing tissue samples, it's discovered that Godzilla is an ever-evolving creature, able to reproduce asexually. The United Nations, aware of this, informs Japan that thermonuclear weapons will be used against Godzilla should the Japanese fail to subdue it in a few days. Evacuations are ordered in multiple prefectures in preparation. Unwilling to see nuclear weapons detonated in Japan again, Patterson uses her political connections to buy time for Yaguchi's team, in which the interim government has little faith. Yaguchi's team manages to decipher Goro Maki's encoded research using origami. The team adjusts its plan and procures the means to conduct its deep freeze plan with international support. Hours before the planned nuclear attack, Japan enacts the deep freeze plan. Godzilla is provoked into expending its atomic breath and energy against Predator and Reaper drones. The team then detonates nearby buildings and sends unmanned trains loaded with explosives towards Godzilla's feet, subduing it, and enabling tankers full of coagulant to inject it into Godzilla's mouth. Many are killed, but Godzilla is frozen solid. In the aftermath, the fallout from Godzilla's attack is discovered to have a very short half-life, and Tokyo can soon be rebuilt. The international community agrees to cancel the nuclear attack on condition that, in the event of Godzilla's reawakening, an immediate thermonuclear strike will be executed. On Godzilla's tail, humanoid creatures appear frozen in the process of emerging, their arms reaching towards the sky. Beautiful, beautiful. What do you say we get into some fun facts and some numbers here? 100%. All right, I'll give you some fun facts first. Shin Godzilla was the top grossing film in the Japanese box office during its opening weekend, earning 625 million yen, or around 6.1 million US dollars, and beating out Finding Dory in the box office, which, uh, mm, not a biggest fan of Finding Nori, Finding Dory, but, uh, you put on Finding Nemo and I'll sit there and watch for days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that movie made bank. So, I mean, I know it's in Japan and it's a hometown Japanese movie beating an American movie. But American movies tend to do kind of well in Japan, especially animated stuff, Pixar stuff. So so Godzilla beating Finding Dory is a pretty big win because that movie did make bank. It absolutely did. Uh, Shin Godzilla received 10 nominations in the Japanese Academy Prize, by far the most in the series. This film was nominated for Picture of the Year, uh, Director of the Year, 
uh, encompassing both Hideki Anno and Shinji Higuchi. Outstanding performance by an actor in a leading role, which was Hiroshi, Hiroki Hasegawa. Outstanding performance by an actress in a supporting role, both Satami Ishihara and Makiko Ichikawa. Outstanding achievement in music by Shiro Segusi. Outstanding achievement in cinematography by Kosuke Yamada. Outstanding achievement in lighting direction by Tamayuki Kawabe. And outstanding achievement in art direction, Yuji Hayashida and Iri Sakashima. Outstanding achievement in sound recording by Jun Nakarama and Haru Yamada. And outstanding achievement in film editing by Hideko Hideki Anno and Atsuki Sato. So, I mean, this was nominated for almost everything. Yeah, and I can uh, I can tell you, I remember the hype amongst the oh, fan base when uh, when this movie was announced uh, with Hideaki Anno and uh, Shinji Higuchi working on it because Hideaki Anno uh, was the creator and sort of head of uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion, which is a very popular and iconic Japanese anime. It was an anime series, and there's been a, also a, a number of films that were also impressive just you know, it's essentially a sort of mecha kaiju type of anime, but incredibly dark, incredibly serious, incredibly hard sci-fi. And so it's iconic for a generation. So I remember the hype everyone had when it was announced that that he was going to be making a Godzilla movie. And, and Shinji Higuchi did a lot of uh, design work and storyboard work on that series, while also Shinji Higuchi did effects work for the Gamera 90s trilogy and some sequences of, of GMK. So... That's also like he comes highly praised and highly rated. So, so it was a team. Then being announced as a team, being the sort of like writer, director, VFX supervisor of this film, was like a it was it was a big announcement. It was it, it got a lot of hype, and they absolutely delivered. Like this is like their their opus in terms of all of the kind of work they've done before, and they kind of fire on all cylinders here. So it it was a lot of hype, and and it was so pleasant to hear about the movie finding so much financial success and, and and awards success in japan it was always i'm always happy to hear about that for the godzilla movies yeah absolutely I, anytime one of these films does good you know like it it just it pulls on your heartstrings a little bit makes you a little happy yeah you know it's like it's like there's nothing to uh you know godzilla's legacy solidified but every new thing that comes out and finds a lot of success is just like one more feather in the cap one more, one more, you know, jewel in the crown and one more like cementing of the legacy. You know, it's like Godzilla is not like a legacy that's over and done with. You know, this movie came out in 2016 and it sold more tickets than any Godzilla film since the 60s, you know, which is a pretty that's a pretty big deal considering that film attendance kind of just declines over time. And and then it it, it kind of swept the equivalent of, of the Japanese Academy Awards, you know, so it's like. You know, it'd be like a Godzilla movie over here winning an Oscar for best director and best and and best picture and stuff. You know, it's like that's a pretty that's a pretty big deal. So, it, it you know, when you hear stories about like, oh, Godzilla Final Wars was the 50th anniversary movie and it kind of flopped in Japan and and things like that. You know, it's like it's disheartening. But then to see a movie like this come out and just kind of fire on all cylinders. It's like, yeah, Godzilla is not only back. He was never gone. And, you know, he's still He's still up at the upper echelon of, of pop culture and popularity, which I always I always love. Absolutely. He is still the king of the monsters. Exactly. King of the franchises is the term I love to use. That too. Absolutely. That too. Uh, Shin Godzilla is the first Toho produced Godzilla film since Terror of Mecha Godzilla to, re- to be released in a month other than December. That, no, I don't have much to say about that, except it's interesting. Yeah, this one was July. I didn't know it was that long that they had kept them in December. Yeah, because all I believe all the Heisei are December. Yeah. Sheesh. The almost 12-year gap between Godzilla Final Wars and this film is the longest ever period of time between the release of two Toho Godzilla films, passing the previous record set by the hiatus between Terror of Mechagodzilla and the return of Godzilla by nearly three years. Yeah, yeah, longest for Toho, but you know, we luckily got uh, got Godzilla twenty fourteen in the in the gap there to 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 break it up. Yeah, absolutely, because twelve that that is a long time. But you know, I mean, it they revived the franchise with a bang. So I'm Completely, absolutely you know. came out with a killer 
film in Shin Godzilla and made it worth the wait for Japanese audiences and, you know, American audiences who are Godzilla fans. 100%. I mean, you know, the the dream of sort of Toho and Legendary both producing Godzilla films and Godzilla projects kind of in parallel, like that's something you always wish would happen. And so it was, it's nice to see it realized here and now. Absolutely. Shin Godzilla is the first Toho Godzilla film not to feature actor Koichi Ueda in a role since the return of Godzilla in 1984. Wow. That's interesting. It's always, always interesting. I try to find some yeah, fun like, stuff for us. It, it, it's always, <laughs> yeah, and it's always tough. And again, you know, we're just a couple of dumb Americans that aren't necessarily paying the closest attention to all of the actors. But it, it's always fun to hear that they keep, you know, that they give... And and there's a couple in here of some folks like cameos and and things from from other films and 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 things like that. So it's always nice when the new films have these connective threads and things that tie them all together. You know, one thing I love about the the score for this movie is that it has so many vintage tracks from other Godzilla movies. It's like, yeah, we're doing a new entry and it's a totally new reboot, but but that sort of DNA of making it all feel like it still has cohesion. You know, it's like there's no continuity involved. But, you know, we're using some of the iconic tracks, iconic sound effects. And so it's still connected. And I like that. Yeah, absolutely. We'll get to the soundtrack here in a bit and whatnot. But uh, I do like that. It's a new Godzilla with some of some of the same old music. Indeed. This is the first Toho Godzilla film since the return of Godzilla and first Godzilla film overall since TriStar Pictures godzilla in 1998 to not feature godzilla battling another monster yeah which is interesting that's a that, that's you know as much as that's like the classic formula that's not the common formula and and this movie pulls it off really well i think you know it's always it's an easy thing to just have godzilla whoop up on another monster to throw in an action and some spectacle and things like that but you know it's 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 a little bit more there's a little bit more to navigate to do with just a solo godzilla movie but this one does it well Yeah, I like Godzilla against the military, you know, or the JSDF, where it's it's just it's him against mankind. You know, we got to figure out a way to stop him. And if we don't, uh, it it might be the end of us. That it's just a fun concept to revisit every so often in these films. Exactly. And Godzilla being a bit of a mutating creature in this movie is keeps it dynamic. You know, it's like even when he debuts or appears on screen, it's not. It's not fine, you know, it's the vintage, this isn't even my final form meme, you know, it's like he's still got some growing to do and some transforming to do before he kind of becomes a more uh, vintage Godzilla look. Yeah, kind of, you know, they they try to hit him with the missiles and tanks and stuff like that, and he just, it, it's like he has a form to almost like outwit everything we have to throw at him, so I like that concept. Indeed. And then last, uh, the day Godzilla first makes landfall in this film is said to be November 3rd, which was the release date of the original Godzilla film in 54. Oh, that's a lot of fun. I never knew that one. That's a really cool one. That's a really cool one. And that is all I have for some little fun facts on Shin Godzilla for you. Very nice. Uh you know, I this isn't so much a fun fact. Anyone who watches it will notice, but this is the first movie that sort of brings back the uh, the original sort of opening style of the original film, starting off with three Godzilla foot stomps, a roar, and and another foot stomp, sort of exactly mirroring the original opening sound effects of the first movie. And uh, as we move on in this marathon, there's a there's another film that will that will also continue that trend. So so it's like this weird little sort of uh, sort of tradition now that some of these movies open with the sort of the three footsteps and a roar uh, over the opening title. So so I dig it. This movie kind of brought that back using the vintage uh, Toho logo as well, which is fun. You know, like Final Wars had previously done that using the old school Toho logo. And I think Godzilla 2000 for the American version, they used the more vintage version of the Toho logo. So, so I like that. I like, I like it when movies kind of play around and use like the, the vintage logos instead of the modern ones and, and things of that nature. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. It, it gives it, you know, it gives it a little homage to 
the older films and then it kind of like a little callback and it's yeah. it, it's fun to have those in films you know that are 50 60 years down the road yeah again you know it's like with when you know it's easy to to see when when a reboot gets done to see it very sort of batman begins esque where this is fully like no ties no continuity this is a new batman theme this is a new batman actor a whole new batman origin story like this is a this is a year zero kind of scenario but it's fun that even when you do that 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 films like like uh you know that's one thing i love about this reboot a bit more than than godzilla 2014 it's like 2014 was like a full full new beginning you know and it's like this one at least uses some classic sounds classic music uh classic like you know different things to still link back to to the history and legacy of the character that that i that i wish that 2014 had had done a little bit more i feel like there were some opportunities that that 2014 could have done it to kind of keep the dna of the original series while still being a reboot yeah absolutely you know maybe just a couple little music cues in there might have might have completely changed that film up yeah, you know, and even like you know, if 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 2014 had opened with like the three steps and the roar, that like that would have like sent chills down people's spine, you know, like like there were just opportunities that they could have done to kind of kind of keep keep some of that alive, you know. Yeah, but we we got what we got. We got it here, yeah, and we got it here, so it's okay. It's all right. Yeah, absolutely. I love the three the three stomps and the roar at the beginning. I I kind of almost wish that more films would do it. As kind of like, a, like a their tradition. Own, yeah, like their own tradition for the Godzilla films, but sort of, sort of like the gun barrel sequence in the James Bond movies, you know, if like they all kind of did it. Yeah, like I mean, I, I am glad though that we at least get it every so often, and like you said, another film does it here down the road, and it's nice. But like in 2014, if we would have got that new yeah. godzilla roar right away you know it might have spoiled it for us or something you know yeah yeah it, 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 yeah again you know not hating on on how it turned out but like it would have been pretty cool though if if you just open on black screen and you hear the stomps and then get the roar as the title slams on the screen you know like it would have been would have been a lot of fun would have been a lot of fun absolutely all right do you Want to go ahead and hop into your favorite character? Or you want me to give you some quick numbers first? Uh, we can go numbers and then we'll switch into all the favorites. All right, we'll we'll go numbers and then kick it into high gear. The budget of Shin Godzilla was 1.5 billion yen, or around 15 million U.S. dollars, and it returned a box office of around 8.25 billion yen or around 78 million US dollars so i mean i mean it returned its you know its budget 5 to 1 which is awesome for a godzilla film and i mean i'm surprised that we didn't truly get a sequel to shin godzilla and yeah, yeah. like i i just yeah, yeah, considering yeah. how considering how financially and critically successful it was, it, it is a little surprising that they didn't like press the go button and be like, okay, this is the launch of like our new trilogy or something like that. Because apparently uh, Hideaki Anno even kind of pitched a version of a sequel that would have been a bit more of a traditional type of Godzilla movie, which I'm assuming maybe – Godzilla evolves into more of a of a vintage look, not so gross and monstrous and kind of weird, and maybe probably would have fought some other kind of monster, and it would have been a bit more of a of a traditional. But I think maybe you know maybe this one because it was so successful, they were like, okay, this was like kind of a radical departure, kind of a radical reinvention. Maybe we need to you know let this stand on its own as a as a one off and kind of be a kind of an iconic kind of like one-off entry and maybe we'll, we'll plan for something else, you know, and, and maybe they, you know, because the monster verse films are, are sort of a modern day setting. And so maybe they didn't want something that was just going to feel like another iteration of, of what legendary was doing, which is Godzilla in a modern setting, fighting a bunch of other monsters in that kind of like, I think maybe they were trying to find a way 
to give Godzilla a unique flavor separate from what Legendary was doing. You know, they went into anime and did an anime trilogy, then an anime series, and and now with minus one, they're doing a they're doing a period piece, and that's kind of that's kind of like the thing to kind of set it on its own. It's it's not in the modern world. It's set back in in the nineteen forties post World War Two. So it's like that's kind of the way to like give it its own unique spin, very separate from what Legendary is doing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I would have loved to see where they would have went with a sequel, but I'm okay with a standalone. I I would have just uh, I would have liked of. Uh, them to have dug into uh what was going on with shin godzilla's tail but uh i mean i've read some stuff on it and some theories and stuff and they're all fun but it would have been nice to see where a director could have taken that yeah you know i, I yeah they're like these you know and it's like you could have gone so many different directions like imagine one of those kind of humanoidish things sort of being sort of uh godzilla sized like a kind of dark mutated ultraman kind of a humanoid like battling Godzilla, you know, like, and it's like this weird sort of, it's a, like an, and maybe it has the spines though. So it's like this weird humanoid Ultraman with Godzilla spines and it's just like grotesque. And, and you've got a weird, like it's a Godzilla offspring, but kind of a Godzilla clone, like, and like the whole sin concept of this like weird evolution and, and sort of thing. It's like, you can just see that, like you could see another Biolante or a hit or a Hedora kind of coming out of that kind of mutating creature morphing kind of style that this Godzilla has so it's like you could see it being a natural fit for a number of like Godzilla foes not necessarily all of them so it's like they could have gone to some really interesting places with some sequels yeah absolutely and I mean again this film was huge it sold 5.7 million tickets I mean which was it's quite impressive it's about in the middle for the entire franchise but it's that that was huge a huge return for godzilla i mean again to have to go to find a godzilla film that sold more tickets you have to go back to i think the early 1960s i think you have to go back to like the original Ghidorah or the original mothra versus godzilla to find one that sold more tickets than this which is crazy if you were to try to do that with a modern hollywood movie to try and have one that sold so many tickets that you have to go back to the sixties to find something that sold more. Like, I don't even know if, yeah. if we have any modern Hollywood movie that's that big. Yeah. In 2016, when this film was released, it was actually, it sold the fourth most uh, ticket sales of any Godzilla film. Yeah. That's, that's impressive. That's impressive. When, when you're talking about the golden days where, going to the theater was essentially the only way you could see a movie, you know, where there was no waiting for DVD, waiting for streaming, waiting for the TV broadcast. It was like, you see it. And if it's in theaters and you like it, you see it as many times as possible because that's the only way to see it, you know? So modern movies don't have that advantage. Modern movies, most people don't go to the theater to see movies. They're the ones who wait. So, you know, it's nice to see that this one got people back. Yeah. It had a generally, well reception i mean it, it's uh rated a 6.8 out of 10 on imdb uh 86 percent on rotten tomatoes uh 87 percent of google users liked this film so i mean it it generally had a well a very well reception and i mean you can see why it's it's definitely i i don't know i don't want to say where it ranks for me among all the Godzilla films but it's definitely one that I don't return to very often but when I do it's one of the ones that it's not put on in the background I'm sitting down and I'm paying full attention to it yeah everyone's mileage varies with Godzilla but for me I can definitely say that that it is it is very much upper echelon for me like you know beyond top top third like it's pro it, it's probably very likely in in you know like it without a doubt would be within my top 10 but like it would probably maybe even be within my top five like i love this one like everyone's got their kind of godzilla movie that they, they like like this sort of sci-fi military kind of grounded realism like i can go in for this kind of godzilla movie a lot and and so i love this one well it helps that 
Uh, Godzilla's on screen for 17 minutes and 23 seconds, or about 15% of the film, and he pops in bright and early at just under eight minutes or around 7% into the film. So, and I mean, we we definitely get, for as long as this film is, you know, it's I believe it's... Just under two hours, I think. Yeah, right around or just under. So 17 minutes, you know, you're talking... I mean, you're just uh, just about a fifth of the film. So, I mean, I'd, I'm i more than okay with that for Godzilla screen time. And what we get of him in this film, a lot of it is out in the broad daylight. You know, it's not dark and stormy and raining or whatever else. It's It's right in the broad daylight where the special effects and the CGI are just bound and glorified. And I... I absolutely love the day scenes, the night scenes with like the atomic breath and whatnot, even look, look even better, but we'll get into, I'm sure some of those when we talk about scenes, but I mean, Godzilla in this film is rocking. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's spaced. Like I always talk about like pacing and structure and stuff, you know, it's like if this were a two hour movie and Godzilla's 17 minutes of screen time is the last 17 minutes of the movie. Like that's kind of not really, well balanced at all but it's like the first 20 or so minutes of the movie is just all of them dealing with that initial landfall and attack and then you get a big sort of 20 to 25 minute section in the middle of the movie where godzilla reappears and does his rampage and then and then you get the finale of the movie where they're trying to take him out and 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 this movie does one of those great things that that we've talked about with Godzilla movies before that goes back to the original Dracula, where it's like, Oh, he doesn't have necessarily, it's not necessarily about the raw seconds of screen time, but how much of this movie when Godzilla is not on screen, are they spending talking about Godzilla or discussing Godzilla or discussing his biology or discussing how to stop him? We're discussing who's going to bomb him. Like they do a very good job. And even during the sequences, they're cutting back and forth constantly between Godzilla and what he's doing and the humans. And then they cut back to Godzilla. Like they do a really good job of sort of spacing it out and making Godzilla's presence like cast a shadow over the entire film. Like that is like they do a like the one side benefit of the characters not getting involved with their own human dramas and and love stories and side plots and stuff is that like they are almost always talking about Godzilla in this movie. So it keeps your it keeps them on your mind and it keeps them at the front of everyone's minds in the film. So it's like it just keeps the film moving forward in a really engaging way. Absolutely. And why don't we get into some more of the film and go ahead and pop off with your favorite character and then uh, I'll take it from there. Gotcha. So uh, I'll actually I, I, I won't go with Yaguchi as my favorite character, even though he's good. I actually really like uh, Hideki. Akasaka, the aide to the prime minister, the, the man with the glasses for people that aren't so good with names, who's kind of a sort of the mentor character of Yaguchi, who's kind of always the one kind of trying to keep him level headed and trying to do things a bit more by the book. You know, he's got this line early in the movie where Yaguchi makes this remark about like, we had two hours to respond and, you know, our response was awful or something like that. And he's like, he's like, everyone did their best. Don't be so damn smug. You know, it's like, it's like he's kind of got this like he's this great kind of like even keeled sort of a of a no nonsense kind of a character that I personally really always kind of gravitate to and like. So I I uh I got a kick out of his character the most. He was kind of like by being not very unique or dramatic or wild, he kind of stands out the most cuz he's so kind of like proper bureaucratic kind of kind of guy. So I I liked that character. Yeah, absolutely. He he was fun. But I went with the opposite of him, and I did choose Yaguchi. I I just uh, I went with him in this film, like we talked about before. There's not a lot in characterization for this film, but Yaguchi just he he played it like he was going full force in the film. You know, he was very determined to like figure out what Godzilla was, how to stop him, come up with a plan. And everything that the humans were doing, it seemed like he was a part of or he was leading or trying to lead. And I I like that in a character where like everything that has to be going on, they're a part of or trying to make themselves a part of and figure out everything. And it seemed like everybody looked to him for the answers. And I, I liked a lot in the beginning where he was talking about 
the sea monster they didn't know what he was and he was telling the guys like what they need to do and they were like um excuse me who were you addressing yeah yeah it, yeah he's got that sort of the, that sort of young rebel vibe where it's like to hell with bureaucracy like to hell to hell with seniority like like what's the problem and how do we get it done like let's suspend all this nonsense like that's the cool thing that he does like when he gets his team together like they're just all kind of like free-flowing open talking like collaboration and and it's this great sort of like from what i understand it's this very sort of like young generation old generation like the japanese government kind of sucks but i mean it you don't have to be in japan to be able to say that your government kind of sucks i think that's kind of just true as a baseline like governments are kind of like you know they're always sort of wrapped up in red tape and slow moving and you know what's the old joke of like the last thing you ever want to hear is i'm from the government and i'm here to help you know like so it's like <laughs> you know so it's like it's like it, it's true in japan just as it feels true in america sometimes so it's like and he's kind of got that like he's sort of raging against the machine so to speak you know blaring out that we're not going to take it you know trying to get them off their butts to to get the job done in the fastest most effective way so it's always nice sometimes godzilla protagonists can be a little on the sort of passive side or a little on the reactive side where they're just trying to get out of godzilla's way or survive godzilla or rescue someone from godzilla and so he's he's a sort of active participant in a way where he doesn't have to be like a, a military action guy so it's a it's a unique uh it's a unique kind of protagonist for a godzilla movie but i think it really works yeah, I just like that. Like I said in the beginning, you know, they were asking who he was addressing, like pretty much like nobody pretty much knows who he is or like gives him any respect. But come halfway through the movie, everybody's looking to him for answers. And I kind of just exactly. like how he evolved there. Yeah. And for people who pay attention to the details, you know, they always whenever he gets a promotion in the movie or gets more titles or more authority they update his sort of character subtitle title card and so over the course of the movie he keeps like his his name and list of what all he's responsible for every time they reintroduce him like keeps keeps getting bigger and bigger yeah that's good stuff like i said i i like a character who who kind of evolves like that from a nobody and by the end of it he's who everybody is looking for but i mean those are between the two of us those are two great choices you know it's the pretty much the two guys that everybody's looking for you know i chose yaguchi who everybody looks to and you chose who kind of he looks to for help so i mean they're they're almost one and the same yeah they're a good sort of two-handed you know two-handed side of the story in a bit yeah absolutely the the two-headed snake if you will yeah the two sides of the coin all right, I'll uh I'll pitch in and go first on this one. I'll give you my favorite score of the film. Now, this was a I was trying not to choose something that was recycled from a previous film and I ended up going and doing it anyway. Okay, that's good. That's fine. <laughs> but I I do not have a problem with any of the soundtrack in this film. I I do appreciate the old recycled music and I appreciate the new uh score as well, but I ended up choosing the title that is from terror of mecha godzilla which is again called mm. godzilla appears that one sounds like this That one just gets me ready to rumble, even though he does not fight another monster in this film. That uh, that one always gets me going. That is a great score. Yeah, it's that's always been that's always been one of those kind of uh, obscure but really cool versions of the Godzilla March. And so, like, it's always been one that's like, you know, you don't hear it done a lot in that kind of way. And bringing that one back at the specific moment they use it in this movie it is an awesome moment like i didn't know about a ton of the of the callbacks or reusings when i saw 
this film in 2016. So every time one dropped, it was like, oh, great. Like they're hitting the nostalgia, you know, like it's so good. And, and, uh, you know, to, to pick some of those, like when, uh, when Godzilla sort of mutating initially in the movie, they're playing the classic kind of like Godzilla in the Bay music from 54. And when they, uh, when they're using the trains on him, they drop the, uh, it's it's the it's the invasion of Astro Monster military march theme that you hear in a lot of the Godzilla movies, but it's actually a track from from another Toho movie, and so but it's a ver- it's the same sort of tune, the sort of dun, 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 dun. so like when they use that on the trains, like that's an awesome sequence as well, a great callback. But I actually I, I did want to go with one of the original pieces of music for the movie, and the track that I picked was called uh, "Persecution of the Masses." And it and it plays when they realize Godzilla has made landfall at the beginning of the movie, and it's it's this great kind of like haunting tune that just you listen to the music and it feels like spiraling out of control, like descending into chaos, and it's just like this perfect like chaotic energy of just like they just immediately announce that it won't make landfall and then it makes landfall and then it's just this sequence of the evacuations and the destruction of it making landfall and them trying to respond and figuring out what they're going to do. And it, and if you, and if you, you can look up on YouTube and the lyrics are actually in English, even though this is a piece of original score by the Japanese composer, the, the lyrics are in English. They're hard to understand sometimes, but it's really, it's really, you know, it's a, it's just a great sort of like a perfect theme for almost the, like you could imagine a music video of the entire film set to this song and sort of capturing that energy perfectly so so i love it yeah that was actually my second choice and i absolutely love that track and i'll uh i'll go ahead and play a little bit here so uh anyone who's listening can appreciate this I mean, that's just the beginning of it. I mean, this is a four and a half minute track of the film and it it continues to get better as it goes on. But I, I love the instrumentation of that soundtrack. Yeah, it starts off so kind of small and just kind of sort of like the, the chaos in the movie and the stakes and the scale of the movie. It kind of starts very small and personal and just kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more unwieldy. You know, it's it's you know, like Godzilla himself. So it, it's a, it's a great track. Yeah, absolutely. Those, uh, mine was my, you know, Godzilla appears was my number one and yours was right behind it at my number two. And, you know, yeah, those... I, insi- I, yeah, I insisted on, I had to pick, I'm like, I'm like, I know there's a lot of great recycled tracks. I'm like, I gotta pick, I gotta pick one of the originals, one of the original pieces. I, I went back and forth, you know, I, I think I listened to one, and then I listened to the Godzilla appears and then I listened to, you know, persecution of the mass. I think I listened to him each like two or three times. And then I was like, you know what? I'm just, I'm just going to lean towards the, towards yeah, the it's throwback. Right. And Hey, it speaks to the quality of Godzilla appears that I think it might end up being what it might be one of the tracks that, that gets, uh, that gets picked as a favorite track twice. Cause I'm pretty sure one or both of us picked it for terror, terror of Mecha Godzilla. I know I did. So, I mean, yeah, it, so it's, a, it's a winner again. At 100%. It deserves it. All right. How about, uh, how about we get into our favorite quotes of the film, if you have one, if you want to give this one a first go? Sure. There, there's some interesting ones. One that I liked that they kept kind of going back to, I liked it because it was sort of like a like a summation of kind of the theme of the movie a little bit. It, it was Goro Maki's last words, which is, do as you please. And it's like the the way that they bring that around where it's sort of introduced as a mystery of like, what did he mean by that? And then by the end of the film, they're sort of, they kind of have this moment where he's like, well, maybe it's time for Japan to do as it, as it pleases, you know, sort of 
you know, to get to get out from the shadow of like what these other countries are deciding and determining about us, you know, and and it sort of speaks to the spirit of the movie of like they're they've got this sort of thing hanging over their head of the bomb that's going to be dropped and they've got this this ticking clock that they're operating with and it's like hey you know like we've got to seize the day and and take matters into our own hand own hand so to speak and so so i like that like that's just a line that like i think about the movie and i just always kind of think about you know like do as you please you know it's just kind of it lands for me but there's a lot of great dialogue in this one yeah i went with one from yaguchi that uh where he's like Godzilla has evolved and into its fourth form. And that's when it kind of, I believe when it kind of goes into a, a close up of Shin Godzilla's face. And when that Godzilla appears soundtrack kicks in. Yeah. 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 And it, and, it, it does hit. It's such a, it's a cinematic moment for sure. Like it's so cool. And it, and it's so sort of like, I know you're not really an anime guy, <laughs> but it's kind of, it's got like the kind of anime vibes where it's just like, characters changing and evolving and taking on forms is, is a big thing in, in some anime. And so when it's just like Godzilla has arrived in his fourth form, cut to the fourth form and the music playing, it's it's a very sort of like anime kind of thing, in my opinion. Yeah, it's one of those scenes, you know, that if, if you're at G-Fest with all the other Godzilla fans, that, that part comes up and you're going to hear the whole crowd go Whoa! crazy. Oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, those are I I I like I liked your quote how it's kind of you know the do as you please like it kind of leaves a bunch of mystery. I I did like that 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 caught me by surprise with that one. Yeah, you know what I was just thinking of. This is kind of a weird thing, but you know, like for Toho, they kind of had had three eras of Godzilla. You know, the Showa, the the Heisei, and the Millennium. And like, it's funny that like Reiwa is like their their fourth official Godzilla era, and like the main Godzilla in this movie is in a is in a fourth form. You know, like I'm like that's kind of like I don't know if that's intentional at all. It seems like it's probably purely coincidental, but that's kind of fun. You know. Yeah, it's one of it's one of those things that they might have put in there to see if anybody would realize. But I, I guess we'll never know. But that that is a fun connection. I I like kind of pointing out all the oh that's a coincidence things you know yeah. it's always fun to see what we can point out in these films yeah all right i guess i will go first we'll do in every other and i'll give you my favorite scene which has to be uh godzilla using his atomic breath at night the the glow of the the flames and stuff and it from you know pitch black night and then it turning into from the flames to purple and becoming just this really skinny stream of heat ray that or atomic breath that he's breathing out and it's just it's so the contrast of the the black with like the glowing purple and then the city is just in flames and it, it it just absolutely looks insane like clearly i'm struggling to put it into words here because it's one of those scenes that where you're like just in awe at how good the cgi and like the special effects look and then you see godzilla kind of the camera facing like head on with him and he's still glowing purple and then the flames in the background it's just it's a great scene to bring back his atomic breath in when you know every Godzilla fan in the audience is waiting to get that atomic breath because they know it's coming at some point. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's, it's an exceptional sequence. And, and when you're right, you're right, because that's exactly the sequence that I picked as my favorite as well. And I'll just ramble a little bit on about all the things I loved about it, but, but everything you said, 100% accurate, the color choices, the, the cinematography, you know, you see Godzilla's eyes kind of glaze over and then it initially sort of barfs out as like first like the smoke and then the flame sort of kind of like a nod to the way that Godzilla's atomic breath kind of evolved in the early parts of the series where it was more of like a like a smoke effect in the original. And then they would kind of it kind of became more of an animated beam later. And then it goes like it goes laser thin and and like they're even using like some of the old like like breath sound effects like they go from the kind of one they used in the early movies and then. I think in Godzilla versus Mothra 92 is when they used kind of a version of the kind of beam sound that they use in this one. So it's like, then they go back to that and, 
and it's so destructive. I always like the first thing I said when I was talking to this movie about my brother after I saw it, I'm like, there's a sequence in this movie that would like destruction wise, it would make Michael Bay jealous because it's just pure just setting the city ablaze and just wrecking everything with the power of this beam. And they drop the bombs on him and the and the beams blast out of his back spines and and that's not anything we've ever really seen directly, but it's kind of a riff on the sort of shock waves that he would use in the Heisei series, but kind of just in a little bit of a different way. And so it's just, again, it's just, it's the perfect climax of this extended sequence in the middle of the movie where Godzilla arrives and then they use some choppers on him and then they use some missiles and tanks on him. And then they, and then, you know, they drop the, the air, the air bombs from the U S on him. And then he's unleashing and then he just unleashes this atomic breath and, and he just like decimates the whole area. And it's, it's exceptional. Yeah, and like you you brought up, I completely forgot to bring that up. Was it uh, the heat ray coming out of his spines and tail, and just obliterating and slicing the U.S.'s jets and military, you know, in half, and completely just obliterating them like they were nothing when their hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars of equipment, and just treating them like that he's swatting a fly away. Yeah, it's it's one of the best displays of, of Godzilla using his breath in, in like any of the modern films, you know, it's just it's 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 exceptional, you know, it's like one of those sequences that even the people that don't necessarily love this movie, like years down the road, would be like, Oh my gosh, like that's a great sequence though. Like that's a great display of the of the breath. Yeah, and I know we're not a long way away from twenty sixteen, but you know, uh I wanna give a couple shout outs to a couple other scenes, you know, where we we brought up where they're they send the train cars at him and then they just explode or the yeah, the buildings they're... come and falling and crashing on them like the the CGI of those they hold up you know seven eight years later yeah absolutely especially for a fifteen million dollar film from Japan you know like they're you know with such limited budgets and the kind of time and timetables they use and things like that you know like it it it's not a fib to say that the CGI effects quality of like big Hollywood productions is always kind of a eclipse Japan because they're getting made for, for 10 or 20 times the budget of a film like this. And so to see it pulled off so well and to, and to still hold up so well, just, you know, seven years later, it's very impressive. And, and the revenge of the train scene is great because Godzilla is always stomping on and munching on trains to, to see that, inverted and trains launched at godzilla as explosives like that that's a fun sort of wink and a nod to the legacy of the series as well yeah absolutely this 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 film is fun and like i said the the cgi is what makes this film for me the explosions and the way godzilla looks and all that it it's absolutely what makes the film for me it because we come to these films to see godzilla of course we don't come to see what the human characters are doing or whatnot. We come to see Godzilla. So for the 17, 18 minutes we have him in this film, it absolutely makes this two hour film for me. Yeah, exactly. If we wanted to see a drama, we'd go watch, you know, I don't know, some Jennifer Lawrence movie. You know, we're here, (laughs) we're here to, we're here to watch Godzilla wreck some stuff. Yes. There's a plenty of other stuff that comes with that. And that stuff needs to be good. And we want it to be good. And and it's important to have good characters and compelling stories and all that stuff. But it's like, it is a Godzilla movie. Like, you know, you want to get what you pay for. And that is Godzilla. You know, they wouldn't be Godzilla movies if people weren't interested in watching them for Godzilla. You know, they're not dramas. They're not romance movies, you know? So you need to, you need to get a good value for your return there. You need to, it needs to do what it says on the tin, so to speak, you know, you call your movie Godzilla, you better have a good amount of Godzilla to give people their money's worth. Absolutely. And speaking of the big G, let, why don't we get into some monster design and talk about the different forms of Shin Godzilla. And I mean, his his first form, I don't. It's kind I, of it, just the tail a little bit. You know, I always, you know, because it's like I'm I'm more of a visual person. So I always think of like the landfall is form one and then he sort of stands upright to form two. And then the sort of main event one is form three, but they kind of consider the, the version that was in the water that was kind of just a, a mostly a tail that's kind of considered version one. And that's distinct 
from the one that that later makes the initial landfall i suppose yeah i mean if if uh if we want to consider that version uh form one we we can definitely do that i'm okay with that then i don't have too much to say i was going to go form one with the landfall but i am 100 percent okay doing the tail that makes sense well, to me yeah well i mean i guess the you know and, and i mean there's some concept art out there i think of kind of what that full body version of godzilla would have kind of looked like and, and it was very like whale like so it's like it's an interesting kind of concept but like it's yeah it's mostly just tail so that's fine like there's not much to discuss about there form one is kind of just the tail it's an interesting sort of tail and then we and then we get to the main event form that that sort of debuts on land and it has these creepy fish-like eyes with no eyelids and like it just it's so unnerving and so unsettling to me and it's like this is like the thing looks like it's in like constant pain like it doesn't really belong on land and it's like bleeding from its gills and i like it's a horrifying kind of visual to me and i love it yeah and like you said it's it's always my first thought when i seen it was the gills and it's splashing the blood everywhere and again just those big fish eyes you know it reminded me of like bad boys too you know where he's like you know this is a nice fish he's big eyes but a nice fish you know it did yeah. <laughs> it just gave yeah, me a it, little it, chuckle it looked kind of funny to me gosh, but it, it, yeah when when i see it it kind of always makes me think of the scene in uh the fourth alien movie which isn't a very good movie but there's a scene where sigourney weaver's character ripley ripley eight or whatever she is she finds like the other failed ripley clones and one of them's like this really gross, like half human, half alien hybrid. And it's like, kill me, kill me. And it's like, when I see that first form of Godzilla, I'm like, that thing looks like it just kind of wants to die. Like, it just looks like it's just like, what am I? Like, I'm an abomination of nature. Like, put me out of my misery, <laughs> you know? Like, that's what it looks like to me. So, so that's all I have to say about that one. But it's this great sort of like, I don't know. It's very, you know, we've seen Godzilla sort of be lizard-like and dinosaur-like, or whatever. And this is very much like an aquatic life form that sort of morphs into something else, kind of a Godzilla design. And I dig it. Yeah, once it uh, once it gets into its third form, I guess you could say, and starts standing up on its two legs and gives like that defiant roar. You know, it. I uh, do you want to call that its third form? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, if tail is first form and, and landfall is second form, then, yeah, that's sort of first upright position because it kind of grows and it goes upright and it does the roar. And uh, and it's like it's cool because that's sort of like that. It's sort of like this proto Godzilla form. And from what I understand, I think that form is about the height or in a, in there about of the original Godzilla height. And then so later on, when it's in the fourth form, it's sort of the modern height of the more like 400 feet. So so it's like kind of cool because it's like then like the, fir the first upright form is sort of the size of what the original Godzilla was more or less. So it kind of gives you like a good sense of like scale and perspective. And, and they were going to have a moment in the movie where there's a deleted scene where that form was going to like just like the gills had blood coming out that first upright form was going to have like this moment where it like barfed, like it opened its mouth and like all this like blood vomit poured out. And it was like shown to be like acidic and to be melting things. And so it was kind of like this thing where it was like, they were sort of foreshadowing the breath, you know, like you had the bleeding gills and then you had like this acid puke vomit thing. And then you had like the proper like discharge for the, for the, for the full, full form. So like, that would have been a cool moment to leave in. I would have liked that, but like, it's this great sort of intermediary proto Godzilla form that I dig. Yeah. See Chris coming through again with, with another fun fact. See that I like that. I did not know that at yeah, all. That foot, that dude, that footage is, I'm pretty sure you can find that footage on YouTube. I'm pretty sure it's there and it's uh it's disturbing and it would have been a great creature moment in the movie for sure. I will absolutely have to look that up and check it out because I did not know that whatsoever. Ooh, good, good stuff. Absolutely. Good stuff coming from Chris again, but yeah, I, I don't, <laughs> this, this form isn't too different from the lying down form besides standing up, you know? And, and then once we get to the fourth form, I, I s clearly had seen the cover and the trailer for Shin Godzilla 
but I tried not to pay too much attention because clearly we knew we were getting a different Godzilla from like, I had heard the rumors and read up on it a little bit. But once we got to the fourth form, I, I knew kind of what the face was going to look like, but I didn't know what to expect. So I, I did like the fourth form, how kind of like gritty and mean he looked. He, he looked like he had been hit with a bomb, you know, he would look like he, he was burned and, I, I liked how he looked rough, and I, I wasn't sure what to expect going into it. Yeah, it feels sort of like monstrous. Like it sort of feels like a version of reality where, if the original Godzilla film had never gotten any sequels and it was just this sort of one-off classic from the fifties, like to remake that, that feels like the sort of like modern monstrosity redesign of that fifties design. You know, that kind of like the kind of beady eyeball that's kind of just staring and, and the sort of like, it, it looks a little sort of like mangled and damaged by nature, you know, like a little twisted, like, like it's, it's a really cool design, you know, it's not like the most handsome and charming design, but it's got this great kind of like the teeth are kind of like, you see some shark's teeth, like there's a certain like shark or something that has those kind of like needle like teeth that are like long and thin, you know? So it's like, it's got this great sort of, you know it looks sort of abomination of nature you know it's a very sort of ugly godzilla design so it's not like heroic charming handsome you know frameable picture kind of a thing but it it looks like a monster and it looks monstrous and it looks sort of painful and it looks like it doesn't belong it kind of looks like it shouldn't exist kind of thing and and so it's on brand for this type of movie and so i i really do like that design Absolutely. It's fun. And, you know, I, I like the that they didn't go with the conventional blue or red atomic breath. You know, they completely switched it up and went with purple. So I like that difference as well. Yeah, it's a good it's a good spin on it, a good, unique sort of version of it. You know, uh, like purple, there was a lot of like purple color schemes and, and purplish energy and things like that going on in, in Neon Genesis Evangelion, which which these guys worked on before. So I'm sure some of that purple affinity creeped over into this version of godzilla yeah absolutely the, the, again this this is a fun film i like shin godzilla and i mean i i watch it a couple mm, let me a handful of times a year i'd say along with all the other godzilla films because you know i'll i'll wake up early before my lady and our little girl and i'll come out and just start cleaning and pop on a Godzilla movie, you know? So on the weekends, that's kind of what I do. So, I mean, like I said, I probably watch all these films at least two or three times a year. And this one, you know, this one is no different. Yeah. Most, of, most of them I ever like the sort of first 50 years, I try to do once a year and the modern stuff, I would probably say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of two of maybe two or three times a year. I'll sit down because there's not as many of the modern ones, so you can kind of knock them out. And and sometimes I don't want to watch through all of the classics just to get to the modern ones in the marathon. Because I'm kind of OCD where I'm like, well, if I'm going to sit down and start watching some, I might as well do the whole line in order. But, you know, I kind of put a break at the 50 years. I'm like, I'll watch the first 50 years as a kind of binge marathon, and then I'll kind of pick and choose the modern ones. But, yeah, this one gets some good replay time from me. Yeah, absolutely. And this uh, this film was a huge critical and financial success in Japan, recording the highest attendance for the series again since 1966 and an unprecedented number of awards for a kaiju film. It led to the development of a media franchise dubbed the Shin series, consisting of uh, various films helmed by Hideaki Anno. Uh, Toho followed Shin Godzilla with uh, Shin Ultraman for the Shin series. That was in 2022, and that was co-financed by the Tsuburaya Productions, while also continuing the Reiwa era of the Godzilla series with a trilogy of anime spinoff films, beginning with uh, Godzilla Planet of the Monsters on November 17th, 2017. So uh, as we do, that'll be our next film that we do. Um, but until then, how about we get some uh, final thoughts on Shin Godzilla? Yeah, uh, I love it. I haven't delved into any of those other Shin spinoffs. You know, from what I hear, they're kind of like the 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 character here. Uh, 
uh, Akasaka with with the glasses. From what I hear, he he has like a cameo in Shin Ultraman, but they don't say his name because, like, I guess, like for legal reasons, these Shin movies can't be actually connected, but they're sort of like weirdly unofficially connected. So, like, you know, I've not seen Shin Ultraman, but I hear it's a pretty good time. But I'm not really an Ultraman fan, so I wouldn't have a good barometer. Like, I'm not, you know, I'm not in the pool for people that are like, oh my god, give me Shin Ultraman. So, but I, you know, I hope it's good. I hear it's good. And, uh, but yeah, like this movie, this movie's incredible. Deserved all the accolades. Deserved all success. The success that it had. So I'm really glad that it was that it was celebrated in Japan as much as it was because it does feel like a big giant love letter reboot of of the japanese version of the franchise you know we got something very sort of american and detached with 2014 like none of the classic music starting fresh doing its own take and so it was nice to see this one like be the big throwback to the legacy of all the japanese films and it was nice to see it be embraced by by them so much and and the fan base globally seems to seems to have pretty positive thoughts on this so i'm happy about that yeah, I agree with you. I, I have fun with this one. I like Godzilla's redesign. I like that they brought back some of the classic scores and soundtracks. And then I also like the new soundtrack and scores that they brought to this film, especially the one you brought up, the persecution of the masses. And again, the, the CGI, you know, this is the first Toho film that wasn't suitmation for godzilla so i mean i i think they did a fantastic job with that and yeah. this again this is this is just a fun film and i i'm not as high on it as you but i 100 percent appreciate and respect what we had or what we got you know 12 years after final wars yeah and as a and as a one-off you know it's like i could understand that if this had led to some wild series of godzilla movies when like if this design wasn't your your cup of tea or this style wasn't your cup of tea like that'd kind of be a drag i suppose but it's like as a one-off as a standalone like it's a really really solid one-off modern godzilla movie and i and i do dig it for that it feels very much even though it's the reiwa era it feels very much like in spirit it's continuing the same kind of anthology concept that the millennium series was doing where where each film was kind of its own identity where that filmmaker kind of put their own stamp on it and then bowed out yeah, this is our first film in the Reiwa era. So when it comes to our tier ranking as of now, that will be voided until we get to the anime trilogy and then eventually Godzilla minus one. I figure we will can will we'll contain those five films in the Reiwa era tier ranking for now. And uh the Monsterverse can be its own little Monsterverse tier ranking if you're uh if you wanna agree with that or is there any other way you would want to do that different no i i think that's fair it's it that's the ray watt era so keep those films on their own keep the monsterverse films from legendary on their own and i think you know we can go about that just fine absolutely so as of now shin godzilla stands alone in the number one spot <laughs> yeah uh you know i I could make a joke about whether that's going to change or not, but I mean, if anyone's been listening, they probably know that that's probably not going to change anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, not uh, not from an anime trilogy. I don't, I don't think so. Uh huh. Uh huh. We we'll see though. I mean, you haven't seen them. You, who knows? Who knows? Maybe, maybe it'll be a wild card, and you come away and you'll be like, "Yo, these anime movies were amazing." <laughs> maybe it'll get me into anime, and I'll be messaging you, dude. What shows uh, do you watch? I gotta, I gotta dive in. <laughs> Golly, if the Godzilla anime trilogy is your gateway drug into anime, then you you might not love a ton of anime. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll see when we get to it, and uh, exactly. We we will get to that next week. So before I I say our goodbyes, Chris, I want to thank you for joining me again on Shin Godzilla. We're uh we're one more down on Godzilla, and uh, I can say I every time we get together and talk about these, it's an absolute blast. I love it. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. Always glad to be here. Always glad to talk about these movies. And and yeah, Shin Godzilla is a highlight for me. Love it. So thanks for indulging me. Absolutely. I'll listen to your ramble all day long, but <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think I'm going to have to do that with these next ones, which we will begin with uh, Godzilla Planet of the Monsters, which was released November 17th, 2017. 
And that is the next film we will be looking at in the Godzilla franchise. So again, thank you, Chris, for joining me. Thanks, anyone who's out there listening. And until next time. <laughs> <laughs>